preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Robert Gilson. I direct the School of the Arts at the 92nd Street Y. And um, if you're interested in the School of the Arts or any of our other programs, please um, pick up a copy of the whole Y catalog on your way out this evening. This evening's program with Via Summons marks the second event in this year's Artist Vision series. The next lecture in this series is with David Sally on March 24th, um, and the series will conclude with a lecture by Wayne Thiebaud on April 21st. Um, also of potential interest to this audience is a lecture by jeweler Bruce Metcalf on March 10th. That program will be moderated by Janet Carden, who is the director of the, the um, American Craft Museum, and uh, we hope you'll join us for all three evenings. Our moderator uh, for this evening's pro program is Nan Rosenthal. Ms. Rosenthal is a consultant in the Department of 20th Century Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She is currently organizing a retrospective exhibition of the work of Chuck Close. The format for this evening will be as follows. Nan Rosenthal will introduce Via Selmans. Ms. Selmans will then present a slide lecture about her work. After the lecture, there will be a brief pause while the stage is reset up. Then Ms. Rosenthal will join Ms. Clemens on stage for a question and answer period. Um, if you'd like to pose a question, we certainly encourage you to do so. Um, please write your question on the index card you received upon entering. So thank you again for joining us, and please help me to welcome Nan Rosenthal. Uh, I think most of this audience knows that Via Selmans is a brilliant draftsman and a fierce intelligence. She was born in Riga, Latvia, in 1939. Her father was an architect and builder. In 1944, at the age of five, uh, uh, Selmans and her family, uh, moving ahead of the advancing Russian army, emigrated to Germany. Uh, after four years of dislocation in various places in Germany, they settled for a little bit in a Latvian refugee community in Esslingen. In 1948, the family relocated again to the United States, settling after several months in New York City in Indianapolis. In 1955, Selmans entered the Heron Art School in Indianapolis. She also traveled to New York and Chicago. In 61, she got a scholarship to Yale Summer School, where she met a number of other young painters, uh, some of whom remain good friends, Chuck Close, Bryce Martin. In 1962, she traveled in Europe and then entered the MFA program, the Master of Fine Arts program at UCLA, where uh, the landscape was exotic to her. The next year, she moved to the beach to the Los Angeles artist community of Venice, where her studio and home were an empty storefront building. She stayed there for 13 years. From 1966 to 1972, she taught at the University of California at Irvine and showed her work in Los Angeles galleries and in 72 at the Whitney in New York. In 1979, a survey exhibition of her work was organized by the Fellows of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and it toured the country. In 92, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia organized a retrospective that traveled to Seattle, Minneapolis, and the Whitney, uh, and it's now uh, ending its tour at the Los Angeles uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. Selmans has received numerous awards uh, and grants from the NEA, the Guggenheim, and the Skowhegan School. In 1981, she settled in New York City, where her work is shown at the David McKee Gallery. She continues occasionally to teach. Via, welcome.
Oh my goodness. I have to put out my little cards first. I'm not a professional speaker, I'm nervous. <laughs> but um, what I thought I would do, wait, wait, <laughs> um, is I thought I would, um, well, I thought I'd talk about my work and, and sort of take you through um, take you through the changes that um, um, I went through. And um, I have a, a, some slides, some of which are not too great, but some of which are OK. And um, I'd like to start. I'm used to pacing around. I feel like I'm tied down here. But I'm supposed to be speaking here. <laughs> but um, at this little thing here. <laughs> so um, let me see here. Um, my schooling in the arts was um, pretty traditional. First of all, I, I painted and drew most of the time. When I was a child, I guess, uh, I don't know, I had a little story about a fox, a Latvian story, which I learned to read on, about a little fox who lived in the woods and um, died in the woods, too. And I still have that little book all torn up. And I remember uh, drawing the fox. And I, I seem to remember drawing most of the time as a way of uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, as a way of maybe understanding the, uh, or kind of uh, taking in the story. And so it just very naturally happened that I went uh, on to art school. There was no big questioning about it. And the art school, John Heron, was very traditional. And um, not much happening. But what we, um, you know, painting, drawing, painting, drawing. <laughs> um, what, uh, um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to, uh, by the time, OK, so I entered, I entered art school in uh, the fall of 57. And by um, 62, maybe 60, I was trying to make uh, you know, the great American painting. So let me show you some of these. Uh, I have a couple of slides I found, which I must have used to uh, get into school at UCLA or something. They're, they're tired old slides, but maybe we could have the first one. Eesh. It's kind of too many lights here. Oh, this is a little better. OK, so now forward. Oh, OK. Is this, uh, look at this old slide. Can you believe this? I cannot believe this. Do you think I was maybe looking at Mata or at, uh, you know, I looked at everybody. It was. Uh, I don't know, I raced through looking at artists, uh, <laughs> you know, like you run through the woods. And um, I just wanted to prove to you that I didn't always do what I've done here. This is another painting that uh, is, I guess, what would you call these sort of semi-abstract paintings? This is a fairly large painting, about uh, five feet by three feet. And I remember uh, working on it for weeks. 
And um, so I gave this, uh, you know, I wanted, I loved, uh, really at that time I loved, well, I, I said I ran through a lot of uh, artists, but I loved at that time de Kooning very much. Uh, de Kooning, Gorky, um, a little later Pollock, and I, um, I wanted to, uh, you know, paint a painting that was um, that was going to be a great painting by manipulation of paint only. I gave it a real try too. So um, these are kind of a couple of attempts, but. Um, this isn't working right. Maybe this is better. Is this better? Um, so this is probably what my generation was, all of us were doing. And um, my own feeling was that, uh, I don't know, I couldn't, you know, to me now, this of course looks very decorative. The work looked decorative. It was pretty slick. Um, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, continue. I went out to uh, UCLA and I was flailing around in the studio, throwing myself at these giant canvases. But I did want to say, before I go into the body of work, which I think is probably more original with me, that um, I learned something about, um, the picture plane from, you know, I learned that the painting is an arena that is, that is uh, sort of outside of life, maybe going along with life, but outside of life. And I think that this sort of uh, euphoria of being able to really engage in the painting that I felt uh, in the very early 60s, late 50s, kind of put away um, academic ways of painting, really, for me, forever. And I always like, you know that painting of de Kooning's, of the woman that is sort of grinning? I always thought that she had chewing gum all over her, and she was like touching the canvas and it was sort of like sensitizing the canvas, going from one to another, until the whole thing made what we used to call then a kind of a plastic, real space. And um, I think I learned a lot of things about this painting, but what I couldn't do is I couldn't continue it. And it wasn't just me, of course. There were many other... Uh, people that, that couldn't um, keep that up. Um, see, I had a little note here that said, in my other talk, I gave a little talk at the Whitney, and of course the first question was so difficult that it ruined the whole evening, which was, a question of, um, you know, what is abstract art? And I, um, <laughs> well, I still don't know, but I know that I wanted to be an abstract artist, and I, I thought I have a little note here, because I was thinking today about what I was going to say. I have a little outline. And um, I was thinking that, uh, Maybe I could have stayed with the painting and become an abstract kind of painter or a painter that really paints only about paint, but I think I really lacked the confidence <laughs> is what it was. And so in the way that I have of stopping and starting and, and cutting off movements and lurching ahead, you know, I went on. Um, 
And what I did around 64 when I was at UCLA, feeling very lonely, feeling very isolated, didn't know a soul, had a terrific studio, which I'm going to show you a shot of. Um, I decided to give up gesture drawing. It's sort of like, uh, I was thinking of it today, like um, going out of my mind, you know, going out of my mind and into my eye, going into, into my own experience, looking inside and also going to my eye and looking outside and letting go of the things that I knew painting was supposed to be. So let me, uh, is there a... So this is a corner of my studio with the boots down at the bottom and it's, look at this goofy painting. I don't think I have ever shown this painting. It shows a certain amount of courage to do so. Uh, you know what, I think we missed one painting in between there though, the painting of, uh, let me see. Nope, not going back. Well, <laughs> terrific. Oh yes, this is a, another early painting where I sort of started to look at things around me and, and paint. Now this painting, which I found, this old slide, obviously I tore the canvas off there. It must have been, shows um, one of the painters I used to like that, I, that was sort of the opposite of the abstract expressionist which was uh, Mirandi. I think you can see a sort of Mirandi influence here in this uh, painting. And these were, I tried some conventional sort of still lifes. Why isn't this working? Who knows? Oh, okay. Nope. I'm pressing the forward button, but nothing is happening. Nada. Oh, am I supposed to keep it on the... <laughs> so anyway, what I decided to do is I decided to... Okay, great. Now, how are we going to do this? Okay, but I'm going to press them when I need to go forward. So I tried looking. You can certainly see that I don't have a lot of uh, skill here. But there's a little object in there which, which uh, occurs. It's not going to work. Huh? Yeah. Okay, next. I decided I was going to look. I decided I was going to try to find a more tender touch. I gave up gesture and um, I gave up a kind of flamboyance. I gave up certain ideas that I was involved with of making the great painting and I tried uh, a more modest approach. What I did really in the 64, 65, I lived in this wonderful big studio and I painted just about everything in the studio, all the utensils, my food, the chairs, the lamps. Nope, next. Next please. Hot plate. And um, I think what I wanted to do here, these are not really in any way skillful uh, kind of uh, 
paintings, I think of them as kind of backward paintings. I was just running through things. I was, I was going back to something I thought was sort of primitive, like image, two-dimensional plane. How are we going to put them together? So um, next, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is my little uh, heater being crated up someplace. The idea was to, uh, oh, there wasn't any idea. I, I didn't want to compose. I didn't want to uh, manipulate. I just wanted to see if I could, uh, if I could have a run of just the joy of, of sort of having the hand and the eye go together. Uh, next. It's a very, this is a puzzle that I was working on on the table, kind of a nostalgic. Sometimes this got a little uh, elaborate and pictorial. I've sort of rejected this picture. Next, please. Next. I guess he can't hear me. This was uh, a pistol that somebody, uh, I guess, uh, maybe this is a revolver. I don't know anything about guns, but somebody gave me this gun. And um, I was, you know, part of this is uh, c people sometimes ask me whether, not sometimes, they ask me all the time whether uh, I was influenced by pop art. And in a, and I would say that of course I was, you know, I was, uh, I think the thing that uh, pop art made me, um, um, the thing that it gave me is that it, uh, it gave me the feeling that I could like paint anything. It has the, sort of a little bit of a freedom. Of course, I was really interested in finding a touch that was very, very, Tiny, that was not really expressive, but was still the touch of painting. And I was not interested in, uh, in mimicking a commercial kind of style. Um, I think this, this earlier work looks really, I'm probably spending too much time on, is, looks sometimes kind of childlike to me, as if going back, and it is true, I did go back, not only like to what I thought was a more primitive sort of painting, backing away from more sophisticated and ambitious kind of work that I really wanted to do. But um, also like going back into my childhood. Next, please. Oh, and then some of these objects kind of fell out of the two-dimensional plane. I did a whole series of objects that were... Um, some of them were bigger, some of them were smaller, some of them were sort of toy-like. And as it came about, I did a, next please. Uh, I did a whole set of a pink pearl erasers. These were like things that I, that, you know, I had had in school and that kind of called back um, childhood. They also sort of, um, like, uh, next please, like uh, maybe they had fallen out of somebody else's paintings, <laughs> like Magritte, the personal values. Um, um, which this uh, piece is um, dedicated to Magritte, really. Um, the problem that I felt, you know, when I started doing these objects, immediately what came up is that there was a background and a foreground, and that the background was too distant from, from the plane of the picture. It was, it, and it was like I was trying to make an illusion putting in this carved space. It was, it didn't feel right to me. So um, when it got too much, kind of worrying these things. 
uh, I would build an object. Next, please. This is a puzzle that uh, I did a whole lot of food things, most of which have disappeared. Or I used to throw away a lot of work. It was like um, I sort of ran through it and 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 very kind of in a critical way, I threw it away. Anyway, um, I did this little puzzle. Next, please. This is another little puzzle. These are pretty small objects, actually, and they all uh, were made in um, uh, pretty much two years, 64 and 65. This is um, one of the first ones where there's an image from war I don't know, I was in this big studio pacing around. I was sort of um, kind of going back and forth in time. And I, I wouldn't say that I was reliving the war, but the war images came up. You know, they came up and, and I uh, painted them. Sort of like, uh, I don't know, I was thinking of these early works like baby crawling around. That's what it feels like to me. <laughs> Next, please. Oh, this is another view so you can see the kind of puzzle that there's little plastic balls in there. Next, please. This is an installation shot. I made a couple of little houses. I had a friend, Tony Berlant, who made a whole career out of making little houses, and he would, um, oh, I shouldn't say that really, but you know, he, he did a lot of little houses. He was an assemblagist. And I had decided that I was really not interested in assemblage. I tried to, I tried to think of how else to build a painting and use imagery beside uh, assembling it on a, a surface, but this is sort of an assemblage. These are a couple of houses, one on the left, that is a copy of a house that was in Venice, California, where all these works were done. And the other house is a house that is a kind of farmhouse that I used to see in Indiana, where I lived. Now, to me, next please, these houses have a kind of a obvious, very e emotional kind of quality. Although, you know, I never, um, I don't know, what I used to do, I never really thought, I, I never thought in terms of making an emotional piece. Um, what I had been doing is I had been, since I was living in um, California, I'd been um, collecting little photographs. I don't know why, really, but that's what I was doing. I had tons and tons of little clippings of things. And I started painting them. What I liked about it is that the photograph was already flat. And even though I made, uh, next please, let me show you the other house. You can see a little, what looks to me like a real influence of uh, Mag Magritte there with the little train. And there's a gun up there. And another, next please. This is a, a very dirty, lively slide here that uh, uh, I love these things so giant. They look like banners. It just totally has no relationship to the work. But you can read the image, I guess. But anyway, um, this, is, this is an object that already has like a little photograph on it. This is a kind of favorite painting of mine. Even though the TV, I was hurrying so fast through these paintings that I forgot about perspective and everything like that. Next, please. Um, 
I, you know, I, uh, at a, maybe this was like 65, I decided, I have these little jumps. Usually before the jump, I stop working and worry, bang my head around, walk, you know, worry the painting, worry the painting in my own head. And um, um, I started doing a series of, of objects that were also photographs and that were also uh, sort of had a, another subject, which was the war. And um, I did a whole series of airplanes and sort of kind of disastrous uh, event events like this one where the tail is breaking off of this, uh, I think it's a flying fortress. But you see, there was a certain kind of glee in painting all of these things. It was as if, as if I was free to paint anything, number one. Number two, as if it was a challenge to try to take them into a painting world, which of course is not the real world. So you can see the same sort of single object. And the paintings are, of course, composed. Next, please. But they're composed in very subtle kind of ways, like in the nuance of holding the plane, I mean the picture plane, and then also like of, um, um, you know, making the plane into a painting plane. I don't know. Can you understand this? Anyway, this is uh, <laughs> this is what I was doing, and I and I went to a s Gray's. You know, sometimes people ask me why I left color, which I never left color. I never even thought about it. These clippings were little gray pieces of paper, and I. Um, you know, I, the, the grays are not like restricted. They're mixed out of different kind of colors, but um, I never really made a conscious decision. But you see, I was not, I was now beginning to be very interested in making uh, a painting that was extremely solid, that was dead, that was also lively, that was a single unit that began to project out. These paintings were small. Um, they were not the kind of paintings that you roamed around in and lost in. They were uh, paintings that you had to find your relationship to. There were a lot of things that were beginning to happen. Next, please. I thought the photograph was sort of like a distancing like a, a kind of a veil. Next, please. And a kind of a challenge of having a lot of things to, to transfer, you know, light and, and action and movement, and a kind of challenge to try to um, still it in the peculiar sort of way that I think that paintings have to be, that imagery in paintings have to be still. Next, please. Next, please. You can see a sort of grappling with the space. Obviously, this wing here kind of comes out of the Plane. Next, please. It's a little ship at sea going up. You know what? This must, must have been maybe one of the first kind of oceans. It looks like knitting to me from here, but that I may have attempted here. Next, please. Every now and then, I tried to uh, do a painting that was a little more exciting, or maybe had some color in it. And uh, 
I don't know, it didn't look right to me. Next, please. This is what I usually refer to as my realist painting, which was I, I, was, I had a job at the University of California at Irvine. I painted most of these paintings after I came home from teaching. And um, I used to drive on the uh, Harbor Freeway. Maybe this is a San Diego freeway. See, the San Diego turns Harbor turns into the San Diego. I think this is a San Diego. It's going north. I used to balance a camera on the dashboard, you know, just like having a pal with me. And like another, another thing that would see, and I did this uh, painting of the freeway, which is kind of a terrific painting. I don't know, it's sort of gelled. Sometimes something gels, but I was not going to go this route. Um, I don't know, I didn't, I don't know. It seemed, it seemed too illusionistic, this, this work. Okay, next please. It's a series of drawings that were sort of objects and kind of illusionistic images on the objects. This is, I think, Hiroshima. These are tiny little drawings, and they were sort of an in-between phrase, a, a phase where I don't think I really understood what I wanted to do. Next, please. This is a letter that my... Mom used to write me letters, talk about, you know, kind of inward. <laughs> uh, has a collage, the stamps are collaged on there. I drew these little stamps and collaged them on there. This is kind of a nice piece, maybe because it's a letter from my mother who's in Indiana, 89 years old. But uh, in terms of art, this was not a real interesting, uh, it was sort of like, uh, I don't know. Next, please. I decided to make, it's a grotesque slide, I may say. Uh, I decided to, uh, I don't know, when the moon shots came back, I thought, wow, exciting, exciting. You know, they're from someplace we can't see. They've gone through a certain sort of uh, machine. They've, they've, they were printed in the paper. Then I, I thought, I'm going to bring them to life, you see, so, and put them in real space. So I started uh, doing all these um, moon shots. And um, at this time, I gave up painting. I was in this sort of, you can probably tell by the way I talk, you know, I have these uh, little fits and starts and rejections. I was in a rejecting mood about painting. I thought that it was, uh, I don't know, it was like I was looking for something skeletal, something more real, something that, that was going to really go to the basics of the structure. I thought, what more but to go into drawing, which is such a very basic activity. You know, it shows like the most clearest, your mind, you know, going from one place to another. Of course, these drawings, because I'm basically a painter, are really like adjustments in mass, you know, and tone. They don't really have a lot of line in them. But still they're more kind of, um, still they're more uh, skeletal, sort of. And actually, this was now around 68, and I thought that I had had a real breakthrough. I was not going to put any more objects into a painting. And, and the, the work 
and the image uh, develops sort of together. You can see this better in the ocean images. Next, please. I don't know what's on the next slide, but I... Oh, this is a very bad slide of a painting. You can see from the earlier drawings of, of having a little clipping in the center, you know, then I doubled it up into the whole thing. Next, please. This was a Luna 9 image. Uh, here's a couple of, I usually work like in, uh, because I work in sort of spurts of, of activity, I tended to make a series. And um, here's a couple of fellas. If we had, next please. So this is a moon, moon drawing that I doubled up. I was still thinking, well, maybe I can manipulate something that might, uh, I don't know. You, you, uh, next please. Here's another uh, drawing that has a wire on it, as if, you know, a very preachy sort of drawing, in a way, is this kind of to show that, that there's a two-dimensional thing there. Next, please. So, uh, I think, I don't know, many of you may know me from, like, ocean imagery, which I have worked on on and off since about 1968, sort of like uh, an old friend you revisit at different times in your life. I, uh, as I already told you, I started looking through the camera. I used to walk my dog in the Venice Beach every night, and I started taking pictures of the water. I was going to make a film, actually. I made a few films because at UCLA, everybody was making films. Either that or they were painting like Bonnard and Motisse. So anyway, I was, um, you know, I brought, I had a lot of photographs sent at home, and the photographs were sitting around, and I just naturally took to using them. And um, um, you know, the, it was sort of like a change, like the broken up image here, you know, emphasizes the kind of flatness. And the flatness pleases me because the flatness is what is really there. And um, to me, it kind of like, uh, I don't know, the, the point was always on how to work with an image and how to work uh, with the really physical reality. And, and in this, the image sort of unfolds with the making. I don't know if you see what I mean. Um, it's not really rendering. It sort of unfolds together, like you can't separate the image from the paper itself. They intertwine. Um, and also, I mean, I was thinking that's like, uh, the ocean image is like spreading a color over a surface. So that you have like this real, next please. So, it's a kind of crazy slides. This is one of the, these two were, were two of the earliest ocean things that I tried and they, they're very, uh, I consider them sort of Baroque, you know, they're very Baroque. They actually look like some of the paintings I think I tried to paint earlier. They look sort of abstract Baroque. They have big holes in them. It, I was tentatively feeling out. Now what I did around 68 is I, I started, you know, I went to this with a great deal of rigor and um, I did maybe 20 drawings. Next, please. This is a very large drawing. Not very large. It's about three by four feet. And uh, that's why it looks so much crisper. 
So these were like uh, kind of variations where the sort of, now I think about it, it's sort of like a pun, like the surface of the ocean and the surface of the, of the work sort of unfold together and, and kind of mirror each other. Next, please. The white here is just the paper, and the, the dark is just the pencil. And there's, it's a, you know, the point was to, to have a certain amount of attention and just add, never subtracting, just sort of build a kind of form. Next, please. Now, as I went on, this one is maybe up to 1970, the feeling that I, the thing that I felt is that I wanted to flatten the ocean. I wanted to flatten it more. It just came out naturally, you know? It was like a, a longing to make the, the, the work real in real physical space. Next. So I'll just show you, I think there's, this is a later uh, drawing where you can see that the um, image now lays very, very flat, you know, sort of echoes what's really there, which is this white piece of paper. So, you know, these were very physical works requiring really a lot of rigor. And in the, in the works, I, I really, I listened to the work, you know. I tried to see what it was trying to tell me. It was telling me flatter. Next. <laughs> it's also telling me, you know, darker, lighter, flatter. The, the pencil, the pencil had such a life. So I went through... Uh, Next, please. There's a little back. Every now and then I'd go back and do a little moon, a little moon shot. Next, please. At a certain point there, I thought, uh, this is uh, too boring. Boring, boring's not really a word I would ever use, actually. But I wanted to activate, you know. I thought, well, I can't compose. Maybe I'll elongate and get somebody to interact with uh, the imagery in a, in a more active way. So I did a whole lot of horizons. I'm not sure what I think about these now. They're much more of an active sort of a work, but but... Somehow, I don't think I ever solved uh, solved this work right. Next, please. I did a couple of uh, long drawings, which came out of um, sort of an homage to the pencil. You know, H, 2H, 3H, 4H, 5H, 6H. Before the H is F. F used to be the pencil. I used most of the time. It was a favorite grade. And I did a sort of a scale of oceans that kind of united the, um, kind of invited the pencil, you know, to be part of it. Like the graphite, it's like hitting certain tones. Next, please. These are about seven feet long. This is a really late kind of a ocean image that's craggy and, you know, by this time I'd had a couple of shows and people wanted these ocean images. It really turned me off. Sort of broke into a kind of a, you know, I was becoming dissatisfied with them. Next, please. I went to New Mexico, and I had been, I had been thinking about, uh, well, uh, I did a little interview with, uh, or actually uh, Chuck Close did an interview with me, 
we talked about how work comes about, and, and I was thinking that it comes about from many, many places. I thought that these galaxies always came out of my love for the lead that I'd been pushing for so long. And um, I think that's probably true. Although you see here are all these little units, you know, and the, I had this thing that when the unit like when the little dot got smaller, it's like the image related closer to the plane. I like this. So this is the first little galaxy drawing I did. It's very open and sort of generous, actually, and very tenderly made, it looks like to me now. Next, please. Same time, I started doing some little uh, pieces of desert, sort of little desert images, kind of forming them so they stay in in on the surface. Next, please. Next, please. This image I repeated, I don't know, many many times. This is a very flat one. It's now the, like mostly in your brain that it goes back at all. But anyway, next please. At a time when I was sort of manipulating the image, this, this sort of configuration really came out of having uh, a photograph next, next to me. And at the time, I thought it might slow somebody down. You know how quick people want to go past things. I thought, you know, slow down. Always want to slow down to look. It's a kind of an awkward configuration. And I did a whole series. This is the same image you just saw before. Next. This is an image from Coma Bernices that's sort of a mate to that one that I also repeated many times. It's a difficult drawing to look at. In a way, this is sort of like a composing to me. Next, please. This is a large drawing that, you know, that was part of this series the same image. I repeated the coma bernices many times with different grades. Next, please. And each time, you know, each time the, it's like the, the pencil itself held, uh, held, you know, it's like each time the, the quality, the feeling was slightly different. Next, please. See, this one's kind of pinched a little bit. They were light ones and dark ones. Next, please. This is pro the last uh, ocean image that I used. And I don't know what I think about it. I'm not crazy about it. It seems to me too illusionistic. I think I was wearing out. This is 1977. At this time, I had a major break. You know, I had, uh, I had done a very rigorous amount of, uh, of work. I, I was really feeling that probably I had pushed the pencil like as far as it could go. And I was dreaming about painting, you know, maybe running, going back to painting, or could I paint, you know? So anyway, uh, next please. Oh, this is my studio where I did all the work that you just saw. There's a painting on there which is lost now, but you can see one of the little houses on the back, on top of the case there. I don't know who has that little airplane painting, but I lived in this studio for 13 years. You could see my refrigerator back there. My bed was right beside it. And uh, it was a very rich, um, 
place for me. So anyway, I had a break here. This was about 1977. Next, please. And I did a piece where, in a way, I kind of like, I don't know what this piece was. This was a piece of stones that I picked up uh, on the Rio Grande. It was a three-dimensional piece, a piece that sort of questioned a lot of things about making art for me, and a piece that I thought was really um, a piece that, um, what I did is I, I, I picked up a series of stones. I'd been very, very unhappy in my personal life. I went down on a uh, vacation in New Mexico outside of Taos, walking around picking up tons of rocks like I usually do, looking at them. And I decided when I came back, I had them in the back of my car, and I piled them all out, and I decided that I would sort of, uh, um, very important to say this, that I wanted to uh, re-describe them. <laughs> this is how I think of it. You know, um, I wanted to to make them. I wanted to spend time with them. I wanted to hold the brush instead of, instead of uh, the pencil. And, and I thought, well, how are we going to know this is art? I said, I know how. We're going to cast them in bronze. So uh, why aren't you laughing? <laughs> so anyway, this was a, a piece where I cast uh, I decided on a sort of handful of stones, um, 11 stones. And um, I worked on them for about five years, but not solidly. But it, it, next, please. I'll, so I'll just show you a run of them. The, one of these is a bronze stone, and the other one is the real stone. I thought. I would leave the real stone in the piece so that the person looking at the piece can also sort of experience the kind of intense looking that I uh, did. This is probably the longest time that I've spent observing kind of nature. It's a piece about looking. It's a sort of an artless piece, too, I think. It's, it's um, next, please. There's not much art in it, but it seems to say, uh, you know, if we, hand and eye, I think it seems to say, next, if you can't do anything else, next. So far, the piece is kind of spread out on a, on a kind of a tabletop. Um, I mean, that's the way that it has been presented, and there are a couple of shots here, but I don't think there's one shot of the, all of the things. Next, please. You see, I know these pieces now. <laughs> Next, please. So I think this work that is not a very, uh, I don't know, I don't really, I don't know what I think about it. It's a very kind of conceptual piece, a questioning piece, and I was kind of down at that time. And uh, what this piece did, though, is it rejuvenated me and got me going again. Next, it's a kind of little couple of poetic little stones, huh? That's sand. I think I took these pictures with uh, a camera somebody loaned me for the Guggenheim. I tried to get a Guggenheim. I did get a Guggenheim to finish them. Next, please. When I returned, I re you know, after doing these, I really wanted to paint, but I returned to doing um, 
these lead pieces. These are, I call them star fields. I used to never name my work because I wanted it, I liked the muteness of it, of course. I didn't want to give anybody hints, but I started naming them because people were going crazy. you saying, you know, that one that has a lot of uh, little dots in it, and I started uh, sort of putting names on them so we could tell what was what. Anyway, um, I did three kind of big paintings that were uh, big drawings that were very, very dense. You see, I really wanted to do paintings. This is about as dense as you can get with lead. It's a very sort of optical works. Next, please. So to have a kind of a pressure on the sides of the of the work here, a little bit pushing. Next, please. Now the white here is only the paper, you know, and the and the black is uh, B three. B4, B3, B4, lead. The first one of these, now these works required some physical stamina. They look terrific this big. It's a kind of a change that I noticed that happened after the uh, stone piece, which was that before the work really projected out, you know, and you walked up to it, try to find your place to it, and afterwards, in, even in these pieces, you have to go closer to the work and inspect it, uh, and get much closer to it. Probably came out of working on the stones. Uh, so, uh, next please. Here's another kind of a more uh, civilized picture of, of a drawing in this same series. It's a very beautiful drawing, really. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. This one sort of lays back and comes forward, is nothing, is something. Next. I gave it a try on Saturn. I'd been thinking about Saturn, what a goofy image that is. It's like an eye, like a hat, you know, like a cup and saucer, like a diaphragm. But it's Saturn. It's very hard to draw, actually. I was thinking of, tried a little drawing. Next. Um, somebody loaned me a studio, and I tried to when was this, 1980, 1982? Someplace in there I decided, okay, I'm going to try some paintings. These are a couple of paintings that were at MOCA in a show called Individuals. The one on the right is now destroyed. I never was real happy with them, but I really gave it a real try. These are six-foot paintings. You can probably tell from the floor that this is, uh, I was trying to get back up to a bigger size, and I was so happy to try painting again and to have had the courage to jump back into it. And um, next, please. This is one of the paintings. I don't know. It never, I don't know whether it ever really worked for me, but it, I, I used to think this looked like an old, beat up rubber tire, uh, you know, the slick inside part, because it had so many coats of, of, uh, of um, wax and, and oil and wax and oil and wax and oil. Next, please. So the paintings, since then I've been painting in fits and starts, but painting. And uh, some of the paintings here, I don't know, to me they look like they're almost like, you know, the paintings were hard, like graphite. 
And what I did is I started to, you know, I build them up. I mean, the problem was on how to make the painting, how to proceed. So I tried various things. Here's a the next, please. A couple of very stark works that were very hard, very uh, tight surface, painted many, many times until, until there was a, a, a total kind of barrier between you and the image, slowing you down, you know, keeping you in the physical plane. Next, please. I tried a little softer one. This is kind of a cornier painting, but an, a, 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 a different kind of a painting. I tried to put in a little horizon at the top. I was looking at Gustin's paintings. And he had that wonderful horizons with various heads and spiders and things coming up behind him. I tried a little kind of a horizon. This is a painting horizon. It's not a, it's just to show that that's a, that it's a painting. It's not a doesn't really make sense with the imagery. Next, please. It's a little variation on uh, trying to, um, you know, trying to grapple with uh, maybe the little composing, trying to fit that image in the, in the canvas there. Next, please. Kind of looked like a little clipping, actually, that last one, which it was. This is a much more kind of romantic. This is one of the first ocean paintings that I've ever done. This was also in the 80s. A very uh, soft, I thought, well, maybe I'll try to let the paint be a little softer. Next, please. Another very early, this is a very tortured sort of painting. I had a very hard time with it. Next, please. It's kind of a variation that never really worked, but I've, I, I always sort of liked this painting, even if it didn't work. Next, please. A little ocean painting that I, that I, uh, that got so extremely cerebral. Kind of like a skeleton of an ocean. Very, uh, you know. I tried. To, I've been talking about loosening up. It's the tightest little ocean I've ever done. I think. Sometimes when you want to go one way, you go the other way. Uh, but I was feeling lively, you know. I I liked the painting. I it's challenging. I I, I liked it, you know. It it um, it's very hard. It's very hard to work uh, with an image in a kind of a very unique way, in a way that satisfies all your understanding about painting and to make it. Uh, uh, you know, to make that dual quality come across that it is something and it is something else and it is something and it is something else. Next. yoo -hoo. Oh, you think so? Um, this is from the last batch of paintings where I really had a kind of good run, I think. These are extremely physical paintings, something that you can't see here. You know, I... These are paintings where nothing is happening and some things are happening in your head, but, uh, but uh, when you really look, things uh, disappear. Uh, they're abstract. They're something else. They're solid. They're not. Next. It's 
sort of series of uh, this. What I started doing now, because I was sort of pushing on the canvas so much, is I started backing it. This is a canvas that's on aluminum, which I didn't really like, but I tried it. And um, most of these last paintings are all on panels. This is a very luminous painting that, that has to be uh, seen up close. Now, you get to see the luminosity here, because it's uh, These are all oil paintings. And I believe on these, I'd already started using Alkid, which dries a little faster. So I could, um, it dries a little faster, and it has a harder surface. And in these paintings, I still have a very hard surface. This is also a quite a, an illusionistic painting, but also not. Next. This is kind of variations. What I do is I lay down the image. I feel it. I go up to the edge with a very kind of thoughtful way, bumping against the edge, like respecting the edge. Usually, I, uh, I kind of uh, subtly compose. And then I paint the painting once, and I then I paint it again. Then I paint it again, and then usually I, I start sanding it, painting it again. They're very overworked paintings, overworked. And um, with each working, I don't know, I think when you see the work, there's a sort of a, a layering which is not really glazing, but there's it's a kind of a way of trying to, I don't know, it's like requires inspection to see how it, it's made and then has a certain amount of discovery after that inspection. You know, so, so I mean, what it is is there's a kind of balance between a, an implied volume and a flatness, and I like that. I like that kind of balance and that kind of uh, tension and relationship. Sometimes it's tension. Sometimes it's just a relationship. Next, this is a sparser. Next, here's a painting that. I don't know, it's just an offshoot. It breaks into real space here. Where uh, this is a relief painting, a kind of questioning, like almost like coming up to the surface of the painting and then pushing out past it. Next, please. Here's a little desert surface that's really like knitting. This is a kind of an unfinished piece that has a lot of air in it. I left it like that, just, it has many coats on it, but it's a very open sort of chaotic piece. Next. Now, what I like, I mean, I don't know, in these paintings, there's like a, I mean, what I like to think is that, you know, that the kind of desire for, for space here is like held back and spread out, you know, over the picture plane, over the surface a very intensely worked surface. So it's very, very physical. Next, please. I mean, the hope is that when you look at the painting that you sort of forget what it refers to. It's like, you know, I try to make the painting uh, kind of more real than the memory 
of what's uh, absent, which is, you know, this image of a galaxy. Next, please. Just got to put in this little uh, web here, which is, uh, oh, I don't think that's in focus. Do you focus that a little bit? Say, oh, whoops. <laughs> well, not quite, more the other way. That's better. Every now and then I, I try a kind of a kinkier image just to see um, what, uh, you know, how I can uh, deal with it. This is not really a finished, uh, a finished work, but I like the kind of challenge of flattening this, uh, this out, flattening it out, and, and also making it uh, dimensional. So, you know, um, I mean, the problem is always like, where do you put, like you have a three-dimensional experience, and where do you put it in the painting? So I think that what I like to do is I like to think that I'm like building a form you know, a form that, uh, that uh, fluctuates kind of between volume or an implied volume and between that and, and um, a kind of physical reality. And I think that, like you might say, well, there's not much imagination, but the imagination is in imagining the form, you know, in a very thorough way. So, um, I don't know, that's about it. I think that's it on the painting. Is there another one? I don't think so. Is there one? No. I think I've talked a long time. So let's, let's stop and you can ask me some questions if you'd like. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, the image of the erasers uh, made me want to ask if you use an eraser when you draw. Well, I hadn't been using the eraser, no. I liked the eraser because it was a sensuous kind of a terrific object that every kid likes, right? <laughs> yeah. And I used to have a pink pearl, you know, so then I did these pink pearls, and um, I don't use it. I have not been using an eraser, okay. no. Can you talk a little bit about how you uh, duplicate an image? I mean, you're working from a photograph. Do you use a grid or an opaque projector? I usually uh, use a grid. In the very early paintings, well, first, you know, when I was working with the objects, I didn't use, uh, you know, I had the objects, I just painted them. And then when I started painting the photographs, I had the photographs, I usually had them next to me and I just painted them. And then it occurred to me that if I gridded them, maybe they'd be a little easier to kind of follow. And then I gridded them. And then, um, 
Did I ever use an opaque projector? I did use an opaque projector, but when? I don't know. Anyway, the work, you know, does not, it doesn't really, um, you know, what matters in the work is sort of like a form that develops, it's kind of rich, and that's where the art is. Usually when I, the image, I just sort of lay in, you know, and then, and then I build on it, so. I usually do real primitive means, you know, messing it all up. <laughs> you know, I don't do, I mean, I haven't had any real big system. Uh, could you talk a little more about the changes of scale? I mean, for example, when you juxtapose um, the same image at two different sizes. Um, I, I gathered you, that was partly, to induce closer looking on the part of the viewer, but what if I'd like I to don't know it just developed that. first of all, you know what I did is i I went from painting big paintings to painting very small, concentrated paintings that were very uh you know that were very uh kind of twisted in with the space that were very um uh you know, they had a lot of tension. They they came they came out at you. They were um, you know I like I like that small. I could really uh, I could really um, I like the limitations. You know, it seemed to me as if the limitations uh, helped um, kind of twerk the painting. You know, and get more out of it. It's kind of, you know what, understand what I mean? I think so. And um, you really have a bad cold. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, and I like the way you kind of came up to it and you had to, uh, you know, you couldn't get lost in it and, and that you had to find your relationship to it, that at a certain point you, you couldn't see it, then you came up and then mm. it got flatter. Then it, when you come up very close to it, it all falls apart, and you see that it's only like graphite, mm -hmm. and 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 nothing really. So it had all these sort of changes and levels that engaged you. See, because I had a single image, you know, I had a single image, so it kind of came out and got you, and 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 had all these kind of ways that it uh, that it worked. It's, I don't know. Anyway, I think that's sort of what happened. And when I started putting the images together, it was just that I was, that that sort of way I had of doing that image became a kind of tyranny, you know? Like a single image, it was I was in this rigorous mode of getting up and c confronting this, this, uh, this uh, piece and bringing it all up to a kind of a level that was real solid, you know? Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I thought, oh, I can't stand it anymore. You know, I'm gonna try some other kind of things. Mm -hmm. So that's when I did, you know, then I was like this, and this, and this, and this, and I started doing these things. I started elongating, you know. Uh, I always tried smaller and larger in different proportions. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm a lively person. I, I, you know, I like to no. change the things. I like them. You know, I'm always, um, I'm always looking, questioning, backing off, going forward. You know, that sort let of me, thing. Let me let me ask you um, a couple of more. Oh, I guess biographically. Why did you move to New York? Well. I don't know. I moved here because I thought it would be a little more challenging. I thought I was a little, I didn't think there was enough painting. I was interested in painting. I didn't think there was enough painting in LA. Dick Diebenkorn was one of the few painters. Well, Ed Moses, but I mean, there was, I don't know, then I, I, and I wanted, uh, I wanted more of an audience for my work. If you've ever been to LA, you see five people is a lot in the museum. So all those kind of things I wanted. And um, I think most of them I got, although when I got here, most of the people 
my age were, you know, like withdrawing. I mean, they were getting older. They were all over 40. They weren't hanging out with each other. They weren't sitting around talking about painting. They were buying real estate. So, you know, I, in a way, I kind of missed that kind of imagined togetherness that I thought it had. See, I'd met a lot of people before at Skowhegan when, and, and then, you know, I came to New York every now and then, and a lot of people taught in California, so I knew a lot of women, Elizabeth Murray I knew, Barbara Kruger, you know, Ellen Fail. I met all of Judy Pfaff, and, uh, you know, we, so anyway, so that's how it happened. But I love New York now, I have to tell you, I couldn't imagine being on a clean sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, Via, have you been back to Latvia? I went back to Latvia in 86 for a show that um, um, was put on in the museum for Latvians who live in foreign countries. That's the name of the museum. Just to show you how peculiar that place is. And uh, it was, of course, very moving. I was touched. I was, you know, I was crying all the time. I had a lot of family there. And uh, they were so terrified to look at the work that they just, you know, it was uh, it was an interesting. Do you experience. still speak Latvian? Oh yes, I say, es runai Latvijas valod, tā kā vien vienmēr ja vai te kād Latvijas ir now? Ne. Just asked if there were <laughs> any Latvians, uh, maybe, <laughs> but no. My great great grandfather. Huh? My oh, great great grandfather. <laughs> that doesn't help us out. Um, let me. Well, actually, I have one more question of mine, and then I'll turn to the audience questions. I was curious, what do you think of the work of Anselm Kiefer? Well, you know, I have loved his work, and I have not liked his work, and I have liked parts of his work, and I have I like him a lot. And I think, um, I don't know, it's interesting. He may be a little bit more political. You must know from me talking about the surface and that how, what a kind of, a, you know, I'm a real painting, 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 painting person. But. Um, well, we saw some World War II imagery. In there. Yeah, I know. So he's much more kind of political, and he's maybe gone back to imagery. I don't know whether he was alive during World War II or, no. or not. No, he the, wasn't. Or he was just the very barely, end of yeah. But, um, you know, I, li I like him. Um, one this of the. Is hardly a decent answer, isn't it? But, you know... Well, uh, it just struck me. And I, I Partly because of surface and depth, it struck me, not just... It was yeah, a but you see, things. he does these giant, giant paintings that are almost like stage sets. So formally, the work is so incredibly different, you know, mm -hmm. that I forget mm -hmm. that he also does kind of imagery that goes back, because I don't pay that much attention to the imagery, really. That's sort of terrible to say, but... One of the audience's questions is, what kind of work are you doing now? Oh, I'm trying to do a wood engraving for uh, myself, because I did a wood cut, and I liked the wood cut, because it was so woody. <laughs> and it was also, you know, it was like another dimension. And of course, it involved a lot of work, which I like because it engages me. And then I tried these tools of engraving, and I like the tools. They made these little lines, and they're very hokey. So it's going to be hard to make something out of it. But um, And then, of course, I have all these paintings lined up that I'm continuing my black paintings, trying to um, up the size a little bit. Um, this one says, I read that you had or have a Buddhist practice. In what ways, if any, has this affected your work? 
Don't have a Buddhist practice. I thought. Had one for a, a while, couldn't keep it up. Hard to do. But uh, I'm a real fan of, of the, what would you call it? The really, you can't be a fan of a religion. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'm very sympathetic to Buddhism. And I, I couldn't, I tell you, I couldn't say that it has, you know, it would be presumptuous of me to say that it has influenced me. I, I maintain that I'm influenced by my own working, you know, w working, seeing, working, and seeing what I work, seeing other art. I don't think, uh, I'll tell you what, what it did. When I, am, when I am able to sit on a zafu and, and breathe in and out, I think it helps me um, not project you know, and to sort of see maybe what is uh, in a kind of a nice way. The times that I'm able to glimpse that, I would say that it has a good influence. I certainly answer these questions, don't I? <laughs> I mean, I'm trying. Um, we should. Probably wind up soon, but how did you col color the bronze rocks? What do you mean? Oh, well, so I put the, the I put the work in bronze, sort of to put it in the art category, and then I uh, I uh, I primed the the bronze so that because I had this feeling that it might turn, you know, I didn't want the work to disappear, it might disappear anyway. And then I painted these with acrylic, which um, I'm not a fan of acrylic, but because it doesn't have enough physicality, you know. But I paint, they're acrylic, painted with acrylic paints, and that's it. Okay. Um, someone points out that you said in an interview that you didn't want to invent little marks. And why not? Yeah, well, why not? I don't know. I didn't, you know, because then... You see, I mean, I tried making little marks, and they, they turned to clichés. I couldn't do it, you know? I couldn't, I couldn't make them be, you mean like little marks, like like a collection of marks that don't, I don't know. So I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And, but really, there's a better answer than that. But do you think I have it in me to think of it? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I tell you, one of the things that I like about working with an image, I also hate working with the image, you know, and if you make little marks that are just little marks, I would not be making, working with an image. The whole painting would then be the image. But I like working with an image because in a funny way, it sort of like makes it harder. <laughs> you know, I, ha I mean, there's a kind of a... a a feeling of volume that wants to, you know, you want to go out in this space and you're denied, you know, you're kept back. And I like that double feeling, you see, from an image that implies that and from everything else I do to keep in another kind of a space. And I always think that those two things kind of working back and forth are what build form, you know, and it's a form that I find exciting. It's hard to put into words because, you know, it's all mute stuff. It's, you know, the, the you know, it's nonverbal stuff that we're kind of talking about. But I know my instinct is, is that if there's going to be something wonderful that happens, it's going to be a form that begins to have a kind of a depth that comes out of a, of a really fine-tuned balance. At this point, I'm thinking this. 
you know. One, one final, this last question. Has it been, well, what kind of an experience has it been to have the retrospective? Is that something that you think affects, will affect your work? Well, I was surprised that I could do it with such grace. <laughs> I think that's a good question. <laughs> number one. And number two, uh, it was shocking, you know. I mean, why didn't you do these things? You know, why did you do this and why did you not do I mean, there are always things that come up that caused me a lot of heartache. And I wanted to uh, work on a lot of the paintings <laughs> right there. <laughs> but uh, I controlled myself. <laughs> and it was a good experience. I think I saw some value in what I'd done. And in some places, the work looked just fantastic. It changed in every place. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you know, it had those two things. I was, I, I, I think I see some places that I want to go, but I'm not going to tell you about them, you know. Uh, but I see some directions that I want to go, and I, you know, it's the same thing, seeing limitations and having also a kind of euphoria of seeing the work build up over the years that you feel quite good about. Bea, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.